This video is sponsored by Squarespace. This week, I decided to build and paint a fully modular set of haunted house dungeon tiles, as well as every miniature and terrain piece needed to play through the first few sessions of the classic D&D module, Curse of Strahd. And I'm taking you along for the ride with me to show you all of the tools, plastic kits, and supplies used to build and paint all this stuff over the course of about 24 hours in a single week. And if you want to see all this stuff in action, I highly recommend you go and check out our brand new RPG actual play channel, Howling Elf, where we will be playing through the ultimate Halloween D&D campaign, Curse of Strahd, one session at a time using all of these miniatures and terrain pieces. The first episode was planned to launch today on Halloween, but we all got sick and had some technical issues, so keep an eye out for the first episode dropping very soon. Planning. Curse of Strahd, as written, can start in a number of different ways. But to simplify things for myself, both in terms of terrain building and planning, I decided to start out the adventure directly inside of Death House, a haunted house mini adventure within the larger Dracula inspired campaign that is Curse of Strahd. Death House is a four floor haunted mansion with tons of rooms, windows, furniture, and doors. So instead of building it all at once as a single massive terrain piece, I decided to go with a modular tile system where I can set it up one floor at a time. And then when the players go up the stairs, I can just rearrange the tiles to form the next floor. At first I considered scratch building some walls and floor tiles, but ultimately I only had about a week to build and paint all this stuff. So I decided to go with one of my favorite pre-made plastic dungeon tile systems to do the heavy lifting for me. That's right, today we're going to be using the Dungeons and Lasers tile system. For longtime viewers of this channel, you might already know that I have a ton of these tiles in storage, both kits that I've bought myself from their various Kickstarters, as well as kits that the company sent me for review purposes over the years. And quite honestly, I've been looking for just about any excuse to paint and customize these things for quite some time now. However, most of the Dungeons and Lasers tiles that I already owned were either more like carved stone dungeon tiles or metal sci-fi tiles. And I was surprised to find that I actually didn't yet have any of their modular medieval building interiors. So I reached out to the company and asked if they would be interested in sending me a few of their modular medieval building interior kits for me to paint and customize not only for this channel, but also for our new channel, Howling Elf, where we're gonna be showing them off in actual play. And luckily they said yes. So thank you so much to Dungeons and Lasers for sending over a few of these fantastic kits for me to paint and customize for this video. I really appreciate it. And I provided links down in the description if you'd like to buy some of your very own. They sent me three different kits, but for the surface level of the house, we're only going to be needing this one the City of Absalom building kit. With the other two kits that I requested, the Dwarven Mine and the Sewer Kit being used for part two of this video, where we're going to be building everything below Death House. I'm quite excited for that. When looking at the City of Absalom kit online, I realized it would be just about perfect for our building's needs. Containing the right amount of doors, windows, walls, and tiles for a single floor of Death House. However, after working with this kit for about a day, I realized that while it was technically possible to build a single floor of Death House with this kit, it did feel a bit cramped. And I had to omit some of the smaller, not really necessary rooms, like the front closet and the kitchen pantry, if I wanted to build the entire house with just these tiles. However, I found that if I brought in just a few extra tiles from my existing Dungeons and Lasers, tile collection, specifically the nine floor tiles that you get from one of their cheaper kits, which I forget the name of, the name will be on the screen right now. But honestly, you could sub in any of their wood or stone tiles for this purpose. I think a lot of the rooms in this house could have wooden tile floors and it wouldn't make a huge difference. Using these nine extra tiles, I found that I could build a much more faithful interpretation of the death house including almost every one of the rooms, closets, pretty much everything by making some of the rooms slightly bigger and shifting the layout around just a little bit while not affecting the mechanics of the house, if you know what I mean. DMs who are going to run this adventure, you know what I mean. Day one, assembly and priming. After clipping all the kits from the sprues and making sure my floor plans were working for each level of the house, it was time to start painting. 
To save some time and make sure the pieces had a little bit of durability, I decided to go to my garage and spray paint everything with a matte black primer. Just to see the difference in results, I spray painted one of the kits directly on the sprue and one of the kits assembled as a mock room. I had a suspicion that priming all this stuff on the sprue was the way to go here, but I also wanted to dry fit all the pieces to make sure it was actually going to work for the purpose intended. But yes, after testing both methods, I highly recommend priming all this stuff on the sprue and then painting and assembling it off the sprue. You may also notice that I am priming a wooden turntable, also known as a Lazy Susan at the same time here, and you might already have suspicions as to what this is for. But if you yourself are a bit of a Lazy Susan and you still need a great looking website, one thing you won't have to prime in your garage is this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website and hosting platform that I have been using for over a decade now for all of my website needs. And it is honestly extremely easy to put together. You just pick from one of their fantastically designed templates, add in any extra pages or features you might like, and then customize things to your heart's content, no coding or technical knowledge required. If you can build one of these modular terrain kits that I'm painting in this video, which you definitely can. You can build a Squarespace website. I've been using my current Squarespace website to host a gallery of my painted miniatures, all of my painting reference documents, as well as an online store where I can sell both virtual and physical products. And I've been really happy with my website so far. So if you need a website, why not check out squarespace.com today for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Dana Howell for 10% off your very first purchase of a website or domain. Day two, undershading. Once I'd given everything a few coats of primer, I'd let it dry overnight. And on day two, I disassembled all the pieces and cleaned up any areas the primer missed using my airbrush. Once again, I highly recommend priming these kits on the sprue. It's gonna save you a lot of time. You won't have to do nearly as much primer cleanup. With all the pieces primed black, I gave everything an overspray with a warm brown, followed up by a white overspray of white primer. If you don't have an airbrush, this is all totally doable with either spray cans or dry brushing. The results are still gonna look very good, but just remember I am going for speed here, so I'm gonna be using the airbrush to do most of the heavy lifting. Another tip that I found really useful if you're painting any Dungeons & Lasers tiles is to attach their bases to one of the floor clips like this. And it not only gives you a nice handle to hold onto the piece while painting, but it'll also stand up on its own so you can paint both sides and let both sides of the tile dry after you've painted it. For the walls, I sprayed them from above like a traditional zenithal, but for the floors, I sprayed them from each side to catch the maximum amount of texture. At this point, I also did a little bit of extra highlighting with my airbrush on any of the white wall panels that I eventually want to be that off-white color. After all the spray painting and airbrushing was done, I spent about an hour and a half dry brushing everything with an artist's acrylic white to give every piece some even brighter white highlights before we apply color. And if you're wondering why I'm spending so much time on the pre-shading, I recommend you go and check out some of my videos on underpainting or slap chop. I've linked a playlist down in the description. But basically we wanna get as much pre-shading done as possible up front as we're gonna be glazing on all of our colors later to save as much time as we can. Day three, color. For the color scheme of these house pieces, I heavily referenced the buildings of Gilneas from World of Warcraft. As they are appropriately Gothic without being too desaturated like a lot of other haunted house reference material that I was looking at. For all of the wooden parts, I went with one of my favorite colors in the Speed Paint 2.0 range, Hardened Leather, which is a really nice warm orange brown. And I actually went back and forth on deciding whether to apply this with a paintbrush or an airbrush, as both methods did have their advantages. The airbrush gave a really fast result with some nice fades and transitions and shadows, but applying directly with a paintbrush gave us the high contrast effect in the recesses that speed paint and similar paints are known for. Both look good, but different. Ultimately, I went for speed and sick fades over the deeper shadows that speed paint provides, but I think both methods are totally valid and would give great results, so 
you still really don't need an airbrush to paint this set. I think you could do pretty much everything with a spray can and some speed paint. The airbrush method worked especially well on the walls as any of the overspray just helped the white walls look more shaded and tinted them into a more warm white look, which is what I was going for anyway, so that saved me a little bit of time as well. For painting any of these stone parts on these tiles, I used the speed paint Tyrion Navy, which is a great desaturated blue-gray, and I sprayed this from below to give a really subtle gray effect inspired by the undershot shading video I made with Brent from Gobertown Hobbies a few weeks ago. And after painting all of the modular dungeon tiles, here was the result. I'm pretty happy with this so far, but the house is still missing one major thing. Day 4, Furniture. On day 4, I made a list of all of the major furniture pieces I would need for the various rooms, as well as miniatures for monsters and NPCs that I would need to complete these sets. Of course, there is no way I could paint every single item in this house, but I tried to hit all of the major ones. And as much as I possibly could, I used existing miniatures and furniture bits from my collection of miniatures and bits that I already owned. I painted all of these in a similar way to the way I painted the terrain, basically a Xenophil highlight, and then I applied speed paint with either an airbrush or by hand and called it a day. There were, however, a few pieces of furniture that I couldn't find analogs for in my existing collection. So I scratch built a few pieces of furniture out of mostly balsa wood, popsicle sticks, and insulation foam. For the fireplaces, as well as the stone oven in the kitchen, I carved these out of insulation foam with my X-Acto knife, using photos of real fireplaces for reference. Once I'd carved out the basic shapes, I then carved in the impression of stone bricks using a ballpoint pen, and I tried to vary up the design of each fireplace a little bit. On some of them, I hot glued strips of balsa wood and cardboard to create mantelpieces, and I used larger pieces of these jumbo popsicle sticks cut down to size to create the floor for each fireplace. Finally, I broke up a few pieces of balsa wood to create fire logs for each hearth, and I hot glued those down as well, with some spare bits of foam. For the beds, I used a similar method, carving rough mattresses and pillows out of insulation foam and bed posts out of the same sticks of balsa wood, gluing everything together once again with hot glue. For the bed sheets, I created a 50-50 mixture of water and Mod Podge to do a sort of paper mache. I think I stole this trick from Black Magic Craft, but I couldn't find the exact video where he did this, so maybe I don't know where I stole this from. I dipped the strips of paper towel into the paper mache mixture, and then I draped it over the places where I wanted to create cloth. For the dining room table, I glued three small popsicle sticks underneath one big popsicle stick, and once this was dry, I trimmed it down to the table size that I wanted and then glued on some small sticks of balsa wood to make table legs. For the big spiral staircase that dominates the center of the house on most of the floors, I once again went with a foam carving method. I started out by carving a square piece of foam that would fit perfectly in the space where I wanted the staircase to go. I then used this steel pail that I had lying around to impress a circle into the foam that was about the size of the staircase that I wanted. And from here, I just freehanded the rough shape of what I wanted the staircase to look like using a ballpoint pen. And I started carving away the excess once again using an X-Acto knife. From here, I just freehanded the rough shape of what I wanted the staircase to look like and started carving away at the excess using my X-Acto knife. I then used some of that excess to glue more stairs on top of the existing ones, and I just kept going like this, taking from the bottom to add more foam on top where I needed it, and carving more stairs until I thought I had enough. I also carved this small doorway sort of thing underneath the stairs as that would be where the adventurers would be emerging from on the second floor of the house. And for the middle post of the stairs, I could have used more foam, but I saw an interesting opportunity here to use this little mini log that I found a bag of at the dollar store and I've been looking for a use for. So I glued this on and then carved the foam around it to give the impression that they used an entire tree to frame the staircase. To give the staircase a little bit more structure and to give the bases of the minis a little bit more of a place to stand on the stairs, 
I trim down some small strips of balsa wood to frame each stair on the staircase. And finally, I carved some brick texture into the stairs using that same ballpoint pen technique that I used with the fireplaces. Finally, I gave all of the furniture a coat of some homemade texture paint that I had made for a previous video. This is just the classic Black Magic Craft mixture of 50% Mod Podge and 50% black craft paint with a little bit of sand mixed in for texture. So I painted all the furniture with this mixture and then I let it all dry overnight. Day five. Warning, from here on out, this video contains spoilers for the D&D adventure Curse of Strahd and specifically the introductory Death House adventure. I will be building parts of the house and showing miniatures in this section that I would consider spoilers for the adventure. So if you're planning on playing through this adventure, and specifically if you are one of my players, please skip ahead to this time code to finish the video and avoid most major spoilers. Okay, now that you're gone, let's keep going. For the secret door in the nursemaid suite, I couldn't find a good way to build this with dungeons and lasers tiles while still preserving the floor plan of the house. So I decided to build a false wall out of foam that would transform into a staircase to sort of simulate the idea of a secret staircase door. I measured out the size of the wall first and then drew on the stairs that I wanted with a ballpoint pen. I then cut this out and added more texture to it with my knife and my pen and I framed it with some balsa wood to add some structure and detail and just to help disguise the join where the two pieces fit together. The idea here is that it will look like a normal wall on the tabletop and maybe it'll stick out a little bit, but that's okay. I kind of want my players to investigate it. And then when I pull off the top, the players will see the staircase and they can climb up using their miniatures even if they want. On the one side of the wall, I glued this wallpaper-like material from the dollar store, and on the other, I carved more brickwork like I did with the fireplaces. And then I painted this thing with the texture paste uh, like I did for everything else, and I set it aside to dry. For the bookcases, instead of building bookcases from scratch, I decided to just use a few of the Dungeons & Lasers bookcase wall tiles that I already owned, but I thought these were a little bit too flat for what I wanted, so I framed these wall tiles with balsa wood to look more like built-in bookcases with a bit more depth. I glued the strips of balsa wood onto the walls once again using hot glue, and this took a little bit more time, but it was the most economical solution that I could find for making this many bookcases that looked pretty good in this small amount of time. I then primed everything except for the wooden parts of these bookcase walls using our black texture base. Monsters and NPCs. For the ghost of the nursemaid, I used this night haunt model from my collection with uh, no real changes. I think one of the parts is broken off. And for the suit of animated armor, I used this Stormcast model. However, there are four suits of armor total in the hallway on the second floor, so I just decided to make four Stormcast instead so that the players wouldn't know which one was going to come to life and they would kind of expect them all to come to life to give them that sense of fear. I repositioned the spears on the Stormcast a little bit using my hobby clippers and some plastic glue so that the spears wouldn't be blocking the hallway and they were more or less upright. And I decided to skip making a miniature for the animated broom entirely as I thought it was a little bit too silly for my rendition of Death House. And instead, I added a new optional enemy slash NPC to the library room. This new NPC is the ghost of Gustav Durst, who in my version of the adventure is not a ghast in the basement, but has become a sort of cross between a ghost and a Nothic. So in my conception of this character, he is a one-eyed undead specter who's obsessed with arcane knowledge. I modeled him out of a basic night haunt, removing the weapon and carving away the skull face, and I then primed him in black, and using my glue gun, I added a bunch of strands of transparent ectoplasm to the model, as well as a single dot of hot glue for the single eye. For the wolves in the hunter's den, I ordered some 3D printed wolves from Etsy. I've linked the seller in the description, and I highly recommend this store. I thought the prints were really good. 
I'm going to need about 20 of these wolves for the random encounters later on in Curse of Strahd, so I figured it was probably worth it to just order a bunch of these early on and paint up a few of them for the stuffed wolves in Death House. Plus, having them based up as actual miniatures, much like the suits of armor on the second floor, might scare the players into thinking that they might come alive and attack at any moment, which I thought was a cool side effect of putting them on bases. I also added a potential animal companion to the Death House, inspired by a lot of other creators in the Curse of Strahd community. So for one of my groups, I added a Labrador in a wizard's costume named Thessamire. This was pretty much inspired exactly by this miniature that was sent to me a while ago by Steamforged Games. I believe it's from their Animal Adventures RPG. And for the other group, I added this skeletal cat, which I took from the Cursed City game, and I named her Morgan. I also painted up a swarm of rats from Cursed City, as that's something that might come up towards the end of this adventure. And that's pretty much it for the miniatures. I painted all of these minis in a really simple way, priming them in black and then giving them an overspray in red Vigeo Express paint. I think this looks really cool on the hot glue slime on the spooky ghost guy. Well, and while I was at it, I gave a few of the relevant furniture pieces a spray of this red paint as well. Inspired by my Cursed City color scheme from a few years ago, I then gave most of the minis an overspray in turquoise, but just on their tops, not on the bottoms. This gave a sort of blue tint to all of the miniatures and helped all the monsters and NPCs feel a bit more unified, I think, as a color scheme. I then gave some of the furniture an overspray in turquoise as well, and I went back and forth filling in as much of the unpainted furniture as I could with just these two colors of warm red and turquoise, depending on the furniture piece. I then spent the rest of the night adding subtle touches to the models, mostly using dry brushing to help bring out some of their inherent texture. And for most of them, I first gave them a dry brushing in a light umber, and then a French Mirage Blue. For a few of them, I then applied touches of Faded Ultramarine to give a more cool look, and to bring out some of the bone details that some of the models had, I then carefully applied some bright warm gray for the bone. I painted the eyes of the wolves and the rats in red for a reason you will be aware of if you're the DM and you've read the module. And that's pretty much it. Here is everything I painted for my first few sessions of Curse of Strahd. And once again, if you're interested in seeing more of this train or what it's actually going to be used for, I would highly encourage you to go and check out our new actual play channel, Howling Elf. I've left a link for you in the description, and there may or may not be videos up yet when you click on it, but if you subscribe and click that little bell, it'll tell you when we put up our first episode. Thank you so much to all of our generous patrons for supporting this channel. You can see all of their names going by right now, and if you'd like to see your own name up there or get on our Discord server, you can do that over at patreon.com slash Dana Howell. And with that, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.